Hey y'all, welcome. Welcome back to Inner Stage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a stream of my friends. And today I have here with me Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. Oh my gosh. And look at your hair. Okay. Thank you. Tell Thank everybody, you so much. tell everybody about the hair. How did this happen? Okay. So for my writing class for ELA, I have sixth graders and we have argumentative writing. And every year I let them write a persuasive paragraph about what color my hair should be. And this year's winner was sunset. And so therefore we have sunset hair. I love it. I love it. It does look like a sunset. It's like so beautiful. <laughs> I and I'm just like, oh, it's so bright and colorful for the uh for the summertime. I'll take it. That's right. <laughs> and uh I last year's was purple, but last year's mm -hmm. runner up was truly terrible. So I'm like, hey, two years in a row without terrible hair, I'll take it. <laughs> well, that's too funny. That does seem like the way that um kids would vote, right? Like the actual mm -hmm. best answer would be number one, and then the the meme answer would be number two, right? The yes. one that they don't well, really like, so but it still I... would be funny. So how I how I mitigate making sure that it's not just like popularity, A, it's anonymous. B, I choose the top five. So there is a little bit of like a hand on the hand mm -hmm. on the scale where I can be like, hey, I'm not willing to do that to my hair. So bye bye. They won't let uh, you do so but, you can't do something dangerous or impossible or whatever. Yeah. I <laughs> and I even made a rule. I was like, no black hair this year. I did not do that my first year, uh, where black was on the table, but I was like, it's impossible to get out of my blonde, my blonde ass hair if you yeah. if I dye it black. So. Like mine's not even that light, but black it will be there forever mm -hmm. until forever. I cut it off. Yes, yes. And I was like not willing to, not willing to go that dark. Did it when I was sixteen. Have no, have no want to do it again. Yes, yes, for sure. Well, if so you did cool. have black hair, it would kind of match what we're going to talk about today. What are we going to talk That's about true. today? <laughs> we're going to talk about. The post-apocalyptic young adult phase of the 2010s. What? Oh my what? gosh. Yes. Listen, we can't talk about Hunger Games without talking about the spark of genre Hunger Games decided to just light on fire. Mm -hmm. Twilight lit vampires into the into the sunlight. Harry Potter did magic in YA. And Hunger Games brought us post-apocalyptic dystopian young adults. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's like it got it got more and more niche a little bit as time went on. But if you were there, you remember you'll remember the absolute explosion of Hunger yeah. Games copycat esque uh, novel series. It was ridiculous. I think I think what made because here's the deal: like popularity of genres comes in waves. If something is successful, a thousand books are going to follow it. I think what was so unique about Hunger Games explosion was how long it lasted. Uh, because, and, and the impact that it had, because also Hunger Games was on the rise and was one of the best adaptations of novels to movie series. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And because of that, they then were like, hey, we can take all of these novels and go to movie series. And that was part of the goal because Hunger Games was so successful. Yeah. So it not only exploded the genre and made it last such a long time, but because these movies were in production, things continued to come out because the feeling was that this love and this want for post-apocalyptic novels was still interesting far after it was dead. Yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um so that was what was that was what was very unique about it and oh my gosh lunar thank you so much lunar thank you tier one for 33 months and yes you got the first Holy day shit. and girl your your package is here your package is here we're going to open it next month on my birthday stream but it's here in the background um in the background. yeah so you can see that it did show up so uh, so yeah what was really um interesting about the the post-apocalyptic boom is that it really was like the the wave was so popular, but the individual books weren't or series weren't necessarily as popular. But publishing kind of was like these are selling w really well, and they were. People were buying them and reading them, even if they didn't like latch onto a large fandom the way that Hunger Games did. Um, people were in the genre and they were reading everything in the genre. Truly, so I have a theory on this because I because the social media has been introduced with the concept of like book hangovers i'm currently in one right now it's terrible and that's when you read a book that's so good 
that the options are you can either oh, read it again or you consume everything that might be parallel to that. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. a part of me feels like it comes from that like development of streaming that we consume TV shows with so much ferocity and then like have that sense of like instant gratification. And I wonder if that's expanded. Like this is just my working theory. Mm -hmm. That's expanded our like how we consume literature because that was also the boom of like streaming was during mm-hmm. the same time mm-hmm, mm-hmm. there's uh, a doctorate thesis in there somewhere absolutely there's somewhere in there yes blue and th- exactly <laughs> teen angst also everyone always teen loves angst. teen angst and and uh why a post-apocalyptic is very easy to be focused on teen so angst so easy mm-hmm. uh but just to finish what i was saying um is that all of a sudden it was like oh hunger games is so amazing i in order to like get it off my mind i have to read literally the same book in mm. a thousand different versions mm. and mm-hmm. uh, I even though it's never going to be as good as that Hunger Games it's never going to get me that high it's never going to be that I'm desperate for something uh yes. and and we see it now if you're part of the book talk community uh it certainly happens all the time I experience that I've been in a Akatar hangover and now I'm in a fourth wing hangover for like a year and it's the worst <laughs> I do but it's feel like, like- and book talk does perpetuate a lot of that yeah. as well. Absolutely. Um, so, but I think that that's like all of our underdeveloped minds when we were reading the Hunger Games were just like, give me this thing and we're gonna, we're gonna dive in. Thank you, Blue. Yes. Um, guesses about which books we're going to cover, you guys. Guesses. Ooh, um, guesses in the guesses. chat would be very funny. Yes. <laughs> if you mention one that is not on here, we'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. For sure. All right. So before we get into it, we probably want to define what we mean by post-apocalyptic young adult. That's a lot of words. What do they all mean when we put them together? So what is post-apocalyptic slash dystopian? Because post-apocalyptic and dystopian are kind of similar, a little different. Uh, Basically, post-apocalyptic is exactly what it sounds like. The apocalypse has happened. Uh, In order for a story to be post-apocalyptic, it has to be the end of our world as we know it and the society that comes after. So typically uh, worlds that have references to Earth or seem very similar to our experience, they're usually, they're not contemporary, obviously they they border on sci-fi, but they have the same sort of seasons that we have. They have the same rules of magic, so there is no magic. Uh, They're technology based a lot of the time there's a lot of references to humanity as we know it but it's like a society afterwards Mm -hmm. Uh, post-apocalyptic is typically focused on the area of survival where it's dystopian is typically focused on the governmental aspect of like society Mm -hmm. uh and and in, in ya these two things are usually fairly merged together so The rules of a post-apocalyptic YA is that you have someone who's between the ages of 14 and 19, Mm -hmm. that it exists in a world or a government that is on Earth after our existence Mm -hmm. uh, and usually has some sort of technology inference sort of like expansion. Yeah. So to put some examples to what Landon is talking about, Post-apocalyptic would be like Last of Us. Society has very recently ended. Most people remember what it used to be like. The cause of that, while many and varied, the cause were given in the narrative is um, that there was this fungus that started a zombie uh, situation. Right. And it's very it's explained. We know exactly what happened well enough that, you know, we can explain it without a lot of details. That's post-apocalyptic. And it's about surviving in um, in kind of the dregs of uh, of what's left of society and what people have kind of scrambled back together. Right. There are political factions that are important to the story, but most of those political factions have been established within the past like decade or so. Like they're very, very, very new. Right. They're very new. Um, And then dystopian would be Hunger Games, right? So in the Hunger Games, there was a post-apocalyptic event uh, several generations before the Hunger Games. We know this because they talk about how, or, or, or in like the interviews, they talk about how like 
Pan Am doesn't believe that anyone else survived like this flooding event that happened. We know that it takes place in North America, but with a completely different coastline because there was some kind of like climate change type of event several generations beforehand. And so the conflict of Hunger Games is not really about that flood or anything to do with it. It That doesn't really matter. That's just context. What the conflict is, is now there's this established government that came up after the post-apocalyptic event um, that now has risen to power and a couple of generations have passed and now there is serious uh, conflict between the people in that government. So that's like the big the big difference. Yeah. Dystopian typically has a post-apocalyptic event somewhere in the past that most characters don't remember, maybe some super old people, post-apocalyptic. It's apocalyptic event, like just freaking happened. Most of the characters were there. So that's really yeah. the difference. But it's also the post-apocalyptic, sorry, it, it's, to, it's also settled. So it's mm -hmm. not, so like it's the difference between The Last of Us, which takes years 20 minutes, 20 years after the incident, and um, uh, the, what's the other zombie show that we were talking about before this? Oh, uh, um, Walking Dead. Yes. Walking, Walking Dead, Dead happens. You are watching as it happens. And that's apocalyptic. Post apocalyptic yeah. is the society afterwards, but a living memory. Mm -hmm. uh, most things that you're going to read uh, for YA in, in this genre is going to be more considered dystopian, but post apocalyptic sounds so much better. <laughs> post apocalyptic is so, is like darker, right? So if you're, if you're marketing to teenagers, dystopian is a little bit um a little bit of an easier sell uh than post-apocalyptic just for the violence and gore level alone even though yeah, like hunger games is quite violent but we'll get we'll, we'll talk also, about that in a second i think with dystopian it's a lot more forgiving and yes. doesn't require as much research because post-apocalyptic yes. you do have to be aware of a human psychology and b the current governments that exist mm -hmm. uh because if you don't have some semblance of a how humans are going to react to trauma and how they're going to govern themselves without like a higher sort of government keeping them in track mm. uh you're not going to write it correctly yeah. you're it's gonna it's not gonna it's not gonna flow dystopian you can be super freaking lazy about it which is something that we're going to talk about some of these like <gasps> These, these these books that I'm about to mention, so you can have loopholes. You can have it be like just because, like you don't have to have answers to everything, uh, and that because it's an already defined world that's different than ours, and so you're not asking us to believe that this would happen now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like this happens hundreds of years from now, mm -hmm. so you know you so don't tell me about the plot holes. Yes, foreshadowing for sure. So. That's what it is. So you're kind of all on the same page with us with what we're talking about and kind of like figuring out what um, what we would consider fitting into this genre and not necessarily fitting into this genre. Um. So before all of you, and I actually don't believe you guys would whine, but anybody who's going to watch this critically and be like, Tiger Games didn't invent the post-apocalyptic YA sort of genre that was existed before, blah, 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 blah. I have... I have information for you, okay? Yes, it existed before, but really only two sort of books slash series have stood out and stood the test of time uh, that were published prior that I actually genuinely think is YA uh, that were published prior to 2008's Hunger Games. Uh, and the first one is The Giver yes. by Lois Lowry. Uh, oh, I think almost every single person who has been to a public school here in America has read this book mm -hmm. uh it is a classic novel it's a morally driven story about a young boy who's called jonas and he lives in a society uh that is free of crime or sadness or individuality uh and at age 12 children are assigned their jobs what they're going to do for the rest of their life uh and so they start training at 12 and they slowly move up the ranks and everything is chosen in this world from your parents to your partners. Uh, and Jonas ends up being paired with the giver whose role it is to be the memory holder of all of humanity. And so it is his learning about the world prior to this dystopian universe uh, that exists. And so obviously and parenthood dystopian, to reality. <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> there is there is extreme family planning. Oh yeah, no, you are you are you are basically told that hey, BT dubs your your genetics are superior. Your your body is is based for this, so you are going to be the person who's giving birth. Uh, like you are bred in some of these circumstances it's really crazy to think that we're letting children read this so the giver (laughs) the giver is a really good book it has eugenics yes it has eugenics yeah so if you have not read it I actually strongly recommend it so my story of the giver because I reading was like one of my hobbies as a kid that I just did I had actually read the giver several years before Mm -hmm. I was forced to read it again for class and um, and I just remember the torture of a bunch of middle schoolers not being able to take the book seriously when I was actually like, oh, we're going to yeah. read a, a book that's really good, you guys. And then they were just focused on about how to pass the memories on the the old dude and, and the main character. They have to like they have to like skin skin to skin contact. And that was gay. And so that was what the entire class discussion became about, about how gay that was. And if if those two were going to like get together or whatever, because middle schoolers are just full of hormones. Obsessed with hormones. <laughs> Uh, no, I think actually uh, The Giver was the first time I had a like aha moment in living memory, at least a uh, aha moment of like the power of words. Mm. And there is a scene where Jonas is watching The Giver throw an apple and suddenly the apple changes and Jonas isn't able to describe it, the words on the page are like what the fuck is happening to this apple? It changes shade, it blah, blah, blah. And that's when you realize Jonas is seeing color for the first time mm-hmm. uh, because it is a colorless world. Spoiler alert for this 1983 novel. Uh, <laughs> really, it doesn't matter if you, the whole thing spoiled for yeah. you. It's still good. You can read it. It's awesome. It's it's awesome. But uh, it's this, uh, and it was like, holy shit. Like you just spent two paragraphs describing the word red without using the word red because this character had no reference to what red is and I was like words are cool <laughs> that, oh, that's kind of true I really don't I really don't remember what my first reading of the giver was like I just remember I liked it and yeah, the giver kind start. of spawned me reading a lot of other uh dystopian books like I went from the giver which is kind of like the child-friendly version of everything else I'm about to list so I went from the giver on to reading 1984 and Brave New World which, and uh, and books like that, which are all very adult. Which, uh, by the way, I just I just want to say this. Uh, 1984 was on the list for YA dystopian. 1984 what? is not YA. No. There's nothing YA about it. The, <laughs> just because we read it as teenagers doesn't mean it's YA. But 1984's main character is this old, sad, ugly dude who likes to pick his boils. Like, that's literally how you're introduced to this character that is not YA. Is not YA. It was listed as YA, and I was like, "No." <laughs> Says who? <laughs> it's like no. calling Animal Farm YA. It's not YA. <laughs> what? Yeah, that was one of the ones I read on this little this little binge too. Um, but only The Giver is really YA out of these yeah. books. Like, if you were a kid, like that read The Giver and was interested in more similar books to The Giver, you had to go read adult books, which is exactly what I did because I thought The Giver was the coolest shit I'd ever fucking read. That was like the bee's knees bestest book ever. So I went to read a bunch of dystopia. Do you want to hear an interesting fact about The Giver? Mm. Uh, It was published in 1983, but they didn't come out with a movie until it was between uh, Catching Fire and Mockingjay. And that's because it was in the height of dystopian YA adult oh my gosh that's a good point that's a good point and that's true I do remember that yes animal farms YA snowball and Napoleon are teenagers blue please you're right the heck you're right I'm so sorry blue you're right I'm wrong I get it uh no the giver the giver had a movie finally come out a remake of the movie uh come out in 2012 which was between was in the height of the hunger games Mm-hmm. Uh, between the, the movies Catching Fire and Mockingjay. And that's because it's because producers saw that A, the Hunger Games books were selling really well, that the Hunger Games movies did extraordinary well, and they went, well, we have this thing sitting on a shelf that we own movie rights to, that we don't have to pay someone for, that's a classic, that will get people to watch this. Let's go ahead and make it, because it's in the same stream as Hunger Games. Yep, I don't remember enjoying the movie. It was, I have to I, say, I, Taylor Swift was in it. She was a redhead or a brunette. What? And I love she. I love. She was that. the redhead girl. 
I had no, I had no idea. I saw the movie when it came out, but I really have very little memories of it other than thinking like this wasn't that good. (laughs) No, it wasn't good at all. Uh, But I do love Taylor Swift and I do love that she wrote a song for it. So (laughs) I was like, that, that slaps. But everything else about it sucks because this is not, this is not a book that should be a movie. It's, it, there's it doesn't nothing make that any happens. sense. It doesn't make any sense it, in the movie. You're just like, why? What's happening? And mm-hmm. it's like, the world, that's what's happening. And reading about the world is what's interesting. Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift. That's right, Lunar. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, awesome. we are acknowledging that YA dystopia did exist before the Hunger Games. Mm. This isn't about, this isn't to say like that Hunger Games created this. Hunger Games made this a trend. That's all we're saying. And I have another example. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if you remember this series, but The Uglies was published prior to The Hunger Games. It was technically. I didn't hear about it before The Hunger Games. No one heard about it before The Hunger Games because you know what made it the best selling list? The Hunger Hunger Games. Games. (laughs) Uh, In case you are interested in reading The Uglies, I have a little like, hey, uh, Uglies is about a world where everyone who is normal is considered ugly. And in order to turn pretty, you have to turn 16 years old. Uh, This book starts out with a girl named Tally uh, decides to sneak into a party of the new pretty town uh, and sees her friend who's three months older than her and has gotten his uh, operation to turn pretty. And it's kind of just a uh, from there it is a take on what that entails, what the government does, society expectations, very big dystopian sort of world uh, and very much not for it our main character fights against the government and oh my gosh that sounds very similar to another book that sounds like the hunger games yeah. so, <laughs> a but thing this happens one is, this one instead of being really focused on the government itself even though it is it's it really is more of a commentary on like the way that teenagers and young adults react to beauty standards that's what it's really about Yes. Like, um, it's so it's got a bit of a different focus than the Hunger Games, but you can totally see if you didn't read it based on what Landon is saying, how like the Hunger Games popularity could make people interested in going and reading this because you are still fighting a government. And, and it's this it's this world of teenagers having to like commentary on social issues. And like, remember, that's the base of what the Hunger Games was. Yes, there was this interesting idea of of like trials and being chosen and and a a strong female character uh, main character but like it also was this like voice of a generation fighting up against societal expectations and norms and the uglies did do it prior to hunger games but it did not find popularity until after hunger games was published and then it made the best-selling list several years after it had been published so it's kind of unique in the sense that it wasn't the it wasn't like the authors or publishers were trying to necessarily ride the Hunger Games wave. It just happened to already be there. And so it got some advertising and some notice. That's really yeah. it. So what is what is the- Charlie of Moist Critical? Blue, I have no idea what you're talking about. You have to tell it. I know who Moist Critical is. I don't know. I don't know what Charlie is. I'm sorry. Um. But that is, those are the two big ones that, like, Mm -hmm. when I was looking over our list of post-apocalyptic YA novels that I was like, okay, this was published before and and also had a lot of big following and had a lot of influence. But both of those influences, A, was already introduced to the American canon, and then B, uh, was popularized after Hunger Games. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... All right, let's get into the post-Hunger Games books. And when I'm talking post-Hunger Games books, I'm also talking in the thick of it. Obviously, there was three books published, four movies. So really, the Hunger Games influence spans, I believe, from its first publication in 2008 until 2012 or 13, when Mockingjay Part 2 comes out. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there is like a four to five year timeline in there in which books are being published movies are getting made Mm -hmm. uh during that event so basically what happens at this time is that the hunger games is coming out it's popular publishers start going through manuscripts they've been sent looking for similar stuff to publish to cash in on how popular hunger games is 
At the same time, authors are also looking at Hunger Games and getting inspired and writing things literally inspired by Hunger Games. So both of those things are happening at the same time. So some of these books that we're going to talk about did have a manuscript version before Hunger Games existed, but many did not. Um, It just kind of depends on the situation of that particular book. Yes. So like the first one uh, is Divergent series. If you've heard of Divergent, uh, it's it got pretty popular. It had a movie based off of it. I was trying to see if it was. I think it was actually inspired by the Hunger Games. Or it, was. it was. This was the, literally it was one of the ones that was. Yeah. This I got super into um, this, so I actually know quite a lot. It was inspired by the Hunger Games. Literally, Veronica Roth read the first first Hunger Games book and was very excited by it and thought, like, I want to do my version. I think that would be super cool. That literally, that's how it happened. Yes. So in case you do not know what the Divergent series is, it is a series of three books, uh, all following um, a, it's a dark and thrilling young sci- young adult sci-fi series by Veronica Roth. Uh, it's a post-apocalyptic. It takes place in Chicago, uh, but it's never referred to as Chicago. Um, that separates its population into five different fractions. And at the age of like 16, based off of their personality traits, very, very Harry Potter-esque. Based off of your personality traits, you get sorted into which fraction you are. Uh, And then those, there are certain jobs that align with each fraction. And so this follows a girl named Triss as she uh, goes to her fraction, discovers the corruption within the government that exists, and, uh, and kind of in some ways tries to correct the civilization because they realize that the separation the separation of different fractions is not good for the people of the whole or mm-hmm. something like that mm-hmm. <laughs> basically so, they just overthrow they try to overthrow the government i think i saw like the first movie of this there's a reason for that blue they did not actually finish all the movies so they did not finish. okay so let me talk about my experience with the Divergent series. So I remember this came out. I was hungry for I was hungry for more Hunger Games, right? And this came out, and I read the first book of it, um, like you do, as many people were. And I thought it was like really cool. I was like, this is neat. It has elements of the Harry Potter house sorting, which I was very attracted to. I th- I always think like, um, you know, I, I don't believe in actually categorizing people like that's bad to do in real life but I find it very fun I love personality tests and things like that right so I I thought this was really cool and it was clear that they were going to work up towards like getting rid of all the factions so I was like oh politically that's interesting to me as well um I enjoyed the main character I thought the romance was a little bit crappy but overall I liked the book and I liked the world The problem, I was not as good of a reader at the time, though, so I didn't, I couldn't tell from reading the first book that this was not really planned out or thought through, like, at all, and so then the second book comes out, and I'm very excited, because I'm like, yeah, I want to see where this is going to go, how they're going to dismantle the factions, that was obviously where it was going to, what was going to end up happening, and, like, the second book was kind of like, meh, I was like, huh, this isn't as good, but I'm still here for it. There's going to be one more book. It's going to pick back up. This is just a second book slump. You know that most trilogies, the second book is the worst of the three, right? It's this the bri- is normal. It's the bridge. Yeah. Right. So the third book comes out. And I feel like I'm reading a totally different book than the first two. I was like, what the heck? Why is this now purely a romance? The one part of the books that was the least interesting. What happened to the crazy government stuff? Why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? It just didn't make any sense to me. And it was awful. And I remember being so, so angry. And this is what happens when you write a dystopian series about dismantling a government without first planning how the government actually works because that's what happened there was absolutely no planning and like um veronica roth even says in an interview because the backlash to this third book was so severe like social media existed at this time but it wasn't as crazy it is there was no book talk right but there was book twitter okay and people were mad and they told miss roth how mad they were yes yes and tumblr and and so she she has interviews after the publishing of the third book where she's like, 
um, you know, I realized that I should not actually think about how I would organize a society because I would do it very badly. <laughs> it was kind of like her takeaway of how mad the third book made people. Hey, Aria, by the way, the government just does things. Uh, Marx definitely said that. He absolutely said that. I'm yes. sure he said that to Angles many times. The government is a is a group of people that does things. It's thing. it's <laughs> I saw the thing. movies until they stopped. Yes, but not the books. Yeah. I thought there was an interesting premise, but it's kind of meh. You're right. Uh, You're 100% right. <laughs> So I think that we also saw something interesting in the Divergent series, which is also uh, it, we cannot ignore, we cannot think that Hunger Games and the genre and the YA world lives in an isolated bubble where one thing is influencing right. everything. Twilight also existed during this time. Like it, it was a little bit before this, but it really sent the YA romance genre way off the deep end. Which means that there that it still exists. Almost every single YA novel that exists is a romance. And so when you follow the series, and that is a trend that happens, is like, oh, the first one is kind of slow burn, and the second one is a little bit more slow burn. And then the third one is instead of talking about the actual big things that are happening, it's all about the relationship because that follows the trend of almost every other YA series that exists. It follows the trend, like, like hung, Hunger Games wasn't like that, but certainly how we talked about Hunger Games was like that. The yes. marketing for Hunger Games was like that. Yeah, and the best thing Hunger Games ever did was make sure PETA wasn't in the first half of the third book. Best yeah. decision ever, honestly, truly. Because if she had to grapple with, like, having the conversation she has in the third book with Gail, with also having them with PETA, life would, that book would be about the romance. It yeah. would not be about overthrowing the government. Yep, and that's basically what happens in Insurgent. Um, there's there's, nothing... in, there's not really much of a love triangle, but that's basically what happens in Insurgent. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I think that I actually am very grateful for the Divergent series for one thing. Uh, it was a fine book series to read. I, meh. It was, it was one of those that I consumed in my post-Hunger Games hangover. Yep. Uh, but spoilers, if you haven't read the series, so sorry. Uh, but Veronica Roth, did the brave thing of killing off their main character True. and that i do think had an impact because you did have like this was a very popular series uh even though it wasn't good it was popular it, it, that did have a huge impact on the traje trajectory of and rules of ya from then on mm -hmm. and that was a cool thing like no main character was safe that you were allowed to do that mm -hmm. uh that it became very, hung not Hunger Games, it became very like Game of Thrones-esque where it was like, fuck, they could die at any time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Like I said, obviously, I got super into this series. So obviously there were good parts of it. Um, mm -hmm. It's just that unfortunately, because the planning didn't exist, the scaffolding didn't exist, the ending was flat. Um, but yeah, I agree. The killing off of main characters, um, Divergent did that for YA. And you can't take that away from Veronica. She did do that. She did. She she did that, yeah. and she ruled it. And yeah. not many people have done it since. True. And not many people have done it as well as she did. True. I a hundred percent agree with that. So yeah, Divergent. Um, read the first one and then throw the rest into a fire. Don't even bother. The first one's the only one of real value, and there's a lot of fun ideas in there that do contribute a lot to to YA today to um dystopian fiction today mm -hmm. so I do actually still recommend the first book there's a lot of good stuff in there but I don't recommend finishing the series truly hey, and I have a theory that like dystopian YA is gonna in new in new adult is gonna resurge here in a, in a few years so like if you're looking for ideas yeah there's a lot of good ideas in there yep. all right let's talk about the next one Maze Runner this is the second popular one it too got a uh it too got a what's we call it a movie mm -hmm. runoff, but it too had the movies stop halfway through the series. I believe it got to death here. I know that there was Maze Runner. I know there was Scorched Child. I think there was a third one. Uh, but let me Google real quick because um, I want to say the yes. third one didn't even have a title that matched with one of the books. But let me just no, Google I don't think quick. so. Uh, but Maze Runner, um, I'll give you a little bit about the book. It's, best, it's basically about a book series centered on a 16-year-old boy named Th Thomas who wakes up in a maze with no memory. Uh, his friends and he make it in the glade, which is basically the uh, the maze, and struggles to survive a series of deadly tests, 
and try to overthrow the deadly corporation that is running them. Uh, so while it's not trying to overthrow the government, it's trying to overthrow the thing that is in charge of them. It was published in October of 2009, and there is no thing to confirm this, but given like at least what I know about the publishing industry, I would make the assumption that this was one of the publications or series that a publisher had rights to uh, because of the quick timeline between the publication of book one and book two or at b- the hunger games and then this book mm-hmm. i think that this is this is something that the publishers already had rights to and probably either greenlit it while it got rights or w- or was like pulled it off of a shelf and went hey we've been sitting on this one let's do it yeah that was a manuscript someone sent. i believe that too and i've always kind of thought that not that i've ever heard any kind of a confirmation of it from the author or anything like that but that is what no. i believe My brother read the books and said it's a lot crazier in later books. I believe that. So this was my experience with The Maze Runner. Um, I heard that it was getting a movie and it was another Hunger Games-esque thing. And I heard that um, that my favorite boy, Styles was going to be the lead character. And I was like, well, shoot, I got to read that. I read the first book and I said, this is enough to watch Styles. I don't need to be heard again like I was with Divergent. And then I put it down. (laughs) I don't even think I made it through the first book. Yeah. Uh, I think at this point I was just like, I don't need it. Uh, It didn't really ever hold anything to me. I think also the thing that I personally was really loving reading was having a main character that was a female, female main character. And this breaks that pattern. Uh, It's actually the only one on this list other than uh, the giver Mm -hmm. that breaks this pattern of having a male main character. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I was just like, this isn't another Hunger Games. I'm good. (laughs) Yeah, I lost lost interest very quickly as well, like very, very quickly. Um, I don't remember disliking it. I just remember like it not grabbing me. Like I think I felt ultimately neutral about the Maze Runner. So and I know that it has some staunch defenders Okay, I know that. It, so I'm assuming are you like your brother is probably one of these staunch defenders. But I have to assume that's because it gets better in the later books, because there was nothing in that first book that I thought was particularly compelling, new or interesting to hook me in, you know. Maybe. So um, so the Maze Runner, I, I do. I don't remember. Also, this was another one that I don't remember having a large fandom presence, which I think is very interesting because dystopia was so embroiled in fandom like you would see. Um, fan art and fanfic and role plays spin up from most of these series but the maze runner was one of the few that i really don't recall seeing at all in this kind of like dystopia bubble that everybody was in at the time i also think um it's very interesting too uh if we're going off the theory that this was sitting on a shelf that this was not inspired by hunger games directly uh that the choice of a company Mm-hmm. versus the choice of a government I think also gives a lot of out for the world building that had to happen mm-hmm. here mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. because companies even if they're huge even if it's like an Amazon sized company is still it, it's still a company yeah. Um, you don't have to build the entire world and so yeah. I think that that's a very interesting choice that this author made smarter uh, decision that, basically smarter decision <laughs> that that didn't have to make it so that he if he didn't know what the cover what the whole freaking uh company was about in book one that's fine because mm-hmm. you can sit there and be like yeah it's run by an evil elon musk right yeah. like and i do so. i did see all the movies so even though i only read the first book i saw all the movies and i did love um what's his face little finger as like the evil like the mm-hmm. crazy guy um, he did a good job, even though a lot of his part didn't make no sense. He he performed it very well. <laughs> what? So what was the third one called? It was called Death Cure. So they it did follow that. Cure. But my okay. understanding from um the people that actually read the books past the first one is that the third movie and the third book really don't have anything to do with each other. I they go off in a yeah. totally different direction. That's my understanding. The, that's actually typical to what mm-hmm. this happens here. Is that Obviously, it happened in Divergent a little bit. It happened... It, that happens a series of like oh that has nothing to do with what this is sunk cost thing he just wanted to see how it ended that was me halfway through the third divergent book i'm already halfway through i'm hating it but i'm just gonna finish it because i gotta know gotta know i gotta know, <laughs> I gotta know. all right next one yes next one 
called the fifth wave. The fifth. Okay. So this is what uh, I am not familiar with. So tell me about it, Landon. Okay. So the fifth wave uh, basically follows a 16 year old named Cassie as she tries to survive a world that's devastated by the waves of alien invasions uh, that have already devastated earth's population and knocked humankind back to the stone age. Mm. So it is, it is very, uh, it, it was published in, the tens so i think that this has a lot to do there's a lot of children that survive and meet each other in this uh so i i remember the movie i don't remember the book as clearly uh but i believe that this this is more focused on rather than upheaving upheaving the government and is more like post-apocalyptic apocalyptic apocalyptic it's more focused on those like interpersonal relationships between uh, factioning children and factions amongst themselves Mm. and so i think that that is kind of where the inspiration came but also that idea of oh the world has ended what does that look like sort Mm. of thing that 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 uh was popularized because of this but it is check this one out because you said the main Mm -hmm. character's name is cassie right Mm -hmm. and there's aliens in it well guess one of the animorphs characters is is cassie and that's it's that's an alien invasion book so, um, so maybe I need to maybe check out just, Fifth Wave. It might be up my this alley. Is just, this is just an alien invasion book. Uh, yeah. but yeah, so it's it, it is that kind of survival grit book. Uh, it's a standalone, as far as I'm aware. Um, this one was the only one that ever made the popular steer like the popular list. Uh, it did get made into a movie. That's kind of all I have about it, as far as this goes because it was it it didn't impact it was just kind of one of those things that was swept up in the tsunami of post-apocalyptic well I think that's the thing that's the thing to be cautious of if you are an author that's writing a trend you know if you're like oh post-apoc that's uh that's very in right now I'm gonna write mine well uh in some ways a rising tide raises all ships so you will make sales but you can also get drowned out so that people don't have a lot of memories of your book because they only picked it up because it was like recommended because you liked the Hunger Games sort of thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I, I know that from experience as far as like reading going, mm-hmm. like God, how many books I've read this year that I'm like, I read it because I was trying to get over this other book. <laughs> yes, uh, for sure. And just being like, okay, what was this about sort of thing? Uh so yeah, that's the fifth wave. That's kind of all I have to say on it. If any of the people who are watching have seen it, tell us if you liked it or not. Uh, if y'all have but love of this, tell us about it. Tell tell me like, if I should read it as a as a hard as a kid that was hardcore into animorphs. Is it related or is it coincidence? Let me coincidence. know. Coincidence, guaranteed coincidence. <laughs> all right. Oh, I forgot to add this one. I added it. At the, I we it's not at the end, but it's here. Uh, the one hundred because I was just about to be like none of the other ones have anything, but the one hundred did. Yeah. Uh, the one hundred is a book series. If you didn't know, uh, about basically uh human the the Earth is destroyed by a series of nuclear attacks, and humans are sent up onto a spaceship shuttle. Uh, that they live for generations. Uh, and they're running out of air. So basically a hundred juvenile delinquents. So children under the age of 18 that have committed crimes are sent to earth to try to recolonize it and discover that if it's possible to live, uh, on the planet, uh, that they think no one is living on, but spoiler alert, uh, (laughs) people are, uh, and they, uh, basically are all expected to die because they think it's inhospitable. Uh, but they do survive and they start to uh, basically figure out how to govern themselves amongst child uh, as children trying to govern themselves and discovering the world. Uh, it is very popular because of the TV show and the books from everything I read have nothing in common with the TV show other than concept. Yep. So Blue, uh, you're right. We are going to talk about 100. So I was super into this TV show. The first couple of seasons I thought were like the best thing ever. They were so awesome and so cool. And um, I remember at the time I picked up the first book. I think I got about halfway through and I was like, this is not the same thing at all. And I I gave up. (laughs) 
Um, yeah. But I understand. I, but I understand that people that experience the other way around feel very differently. People that were like, oh, "My book series is getting adapted," and then they watched the show, and then they were like, "This is not the same thing at all," and they gave up. <laughs> I think that this is an example of one of the things that were was popularized, uh, I believe, theory, no, nothing to back this up. This TV show was greenlit, not because the books ever got popular, but because the concept was popular uh, because of Hunger Games. Mm-hmm. And it's CW. CW was looking for a post-apocalyptic show because of the rise of Hunger Games. And it was like, let's, here's this book series that we already have, we already have bids in on. Let's do that. Uh, so they, and, and also the hunger and also CW has a long extensive history of buying rights to books and then making TV shows that have nothing to do with those books. Looking at you, yes. Vampire Diaries, <laughs> uh, <laughs> other than the names of the characters, those are the only similarities. And so this is very just like within CW to do. So it is my belief that it was like, oh, Hunger Games contributed by, making it popular enough that CW wanted a show that was similar to Hunger Games that wasn't the same concept, chose a fairly low basis fan base that had some people watching, but knew it was going to bring in most of the people of that demographic. Uh, And then people discovered that the books existed and discovered that it was nothing like the movies. Uh, So the books did become popular for a little while, but was disappointed, but disappointed most people because it was nothing like the TV show. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, basically, basically. So like when it comes to the 100, um, I really had not heard of it at all until the TV show came out. And it truly was CW doing the same thing to 100 that they did to Vampire Diaries. They were like, oh, Twilight's popular. Um, We need a vampire show. Let's do Vampire Diaries. And they were like, Hunger Games is popular. We need a dystopia show. Let's get the 100. Um, it's literally that I, I, the show eventually did go off the rails as all CW shows are want to do. It is the law of the universe. And so I recommend the first uh, three or four seasons of the 100 and then you can stop watching. Uh, there's nothing worth of value after that, uh, much like almost every other CW show. <laughs> but that I think first I watched and second first... season are amazing. <laughs> yeah, I think I watched the first season. And I was like, well, this is good. Never came back to it. Uh- <laughs> I was like, I'm going to die in ignorance. It'll be fine. <laughs> you saw the best part. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's good. It was a good theory. Uh, I did follow on Tumblr because obviously all of the faces took over Tumblr yes. for a while uh, and did enjoy the fact that there was queer representation eventually. I mean, everyone died because that's the CW. It likes to kill its queers, but you know, that's fine. I mean, you know how in Vampire Diaries there's like a lot of um black characters but the but, look yeah. at their storylines like it's really not it's like not that progressive like the queerness in 100 is the same way like yeah they're oh, there good. but like not, not in, really n- not in the way that you that you want mm, it's, fun. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. so so yeah don't get excited about that but yes um tumblr role play the 100 cast instantly everywhere everywhere because they were like like any CW show, they were gorgeous. Okay, yep. even the weirdo looking ones were like weirdly pretty. So, um, you know who I'm thinking of? Uh, Murphy can't remember the actor's name. Uh, yep. but yep, he's a weirdo and he's gorgeous at the same time. Somehow, CW, I don't know how they do this, but they do this. Um, and so you know they were everywhere. And so even if you didn't have anything to do with 100, Tumblr fandom absolutely inundated with the 100 whether you cared about the one there was gifts like the gifts of the 100 were were plentiful there gifts galore of this tv show even if you did not follow the 100 or care about the 100 and the main character was this um this beautiful blonde girl that everyone went gaga over so you know there you go but just bella swan yeah Uh, basically. all right (laughs) And our final our final one that we're going to talk about that has a TV show and or movie adaptation is Ready Player One. What? Y'all probably weren't what? expecting this one, huh? I'm sorry, but it is kind of a dystopian world. It definitely now, is. It, it, it is. Like, because uh, it, uh, it, even though the world, I don't think, suffered a post-apocalyptic, if I remember correctly, didn't suffer a post-apocalyptic uh, sort of thing, it did in the way that nobody wants to exist in the world 
And so everyone decided to create this secondary world uh, that has no rules <laughs> other than the company that has determined what the rules are, which because it's a world and there is currency and there are rules becomes a government. Yep. And it's so, and it's the worst MMO ever that no one would ever actually play. And yet it was the most popular thing in the entire world. What I don't because, understand, but it's true. So well, because ready, no one wanted to exist in yeah. the current world. Yeah. So <laughs> so they like they they hit the zeitgeist at the right time and this incredibly crappy MMO got very popular. <laughs> so yes. ready ready player one i read i read the book i loved it but not for the story because it's like 80s reference after 80s reference so it's like very fun it is very fun to read um there's parts of the story though that are really stupid and don't make any sense and it's bad actually it's one of those kind of things yes i liked it it's not good then they made a movie that actually corrects some of the things that are so I bad really in the book the movie. yeah the movie was really good. Yeah. Yeah, because it fixes some of the stuff that's really crappy in the book. Yeah. It doesn't fix all of it, though. So, like, one of the things that's still, like, really weird that exists in the book and in the movie is that this the main character falls in love with this woman, but because everyone lives in the game because the real world sucks, he only ever interacts with her in the game. And then, you know, he meets her in real life, and then she's like, Oh, I'm so ugly. I've got this really cool badass birthmark all over my face. How will you ever love me? And he's like, he's he's like, I'm fine with it. And the narrative like praises him for this. She's hot. She's just got a birthmark. It's like, what? And that happens in the movie too. But what the movie does that is helpful is they actually give her a plot instead of just crushing on the main character, which is great, by the way. Movie is better than the book in this situation. Yes. 100%. You do not need mm -hmm. to read the book, but you probably should watch the movie. It's a good damn time. Uh, but it was in the height of that popularized post-dystopian or post-apocalyptic Hunger Games sort of world. And I, I think that there is a line that could connect these two novels. Yeah. Uh, of like maybe not... I, I don't think Ernest Klein was like, oh, I'm going to write the new, next Hunger Games. But I think er Ernest Klein was like, oh, people are interested in a futuristic type of world that isn't sci-fi. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to make a list technology. of 80s references. Like all, all yes. Ernest Klein wanted to do was make a list of 80s references. And he saw the perfect vehicle and he was right. And and I think that that's, that is where that inspiration came from. Mm -hmm. Of more of like, less about this is the direct inspiration and more about this is what's popular and what can get me published. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. So ready player one. And, and after you've read it or watched the movie, or if you have next thing you need to do is go to Jenny Nicholson on YouTube and watch her video called ready player one for girls. It's hilarious. One of the best YouTube videos ever. It's amazing. Um, watch it. You should go watch it. I'm pretty sure it's Jenny right. Nicholson. I think it's her that, that did that. So yeah, ready player one. It's kind of like all this stuff, except it was for boys. And it was kind of, it was fun, actually. So, yeah. Whoa, the selection. selection. All right. This is not for boys. <laughs> for a series that I did not read. I'm gonna just put that out here up front and center. Did not read. And there is no, uh, there is no interpretation or movie or TV show or anything like that. I have a lot of opinions about this. <laughs> Uh, very, very quickly first, let me, let me give you an insight into what the selection is about. It is about 35 eligible, eligible randomly selected women from across the kingdom, uh, are brought into the, com in to compete for the prince's hand. Uh, the story follows American singer, a five. Uh, America has no real desire to be entered into the selection because she is secretly in a relationship with a boy named Aspen, who is a six. Uh, if that makes no sense to you, that's okay. <laughs> Basically, uh, women are set to compete for a prince, uh, but one of them doesn't want to compete, but has to compete because I believe they die if she, I don't know for sure. I know she has to. I really she don't has know to. what There's happened. There's something why. 
I don't know what happens if she runs away because I also didn't read these. So the other thing that you need to know about the selection is that everyone has a number and those numbers are the factions. So remember our factions yes. from Divergent, you know, you have like the districts from Hunger Games that are, you know, specific modes of production. Well, the selection takes those two concepts and puts them together. So like your family, so fives is the artists, right? So musicians, poets, authors, da da da, whatever. So that's, it's like, she's a singer because her family is a five family. So her only choice is to be some type of artist, which is how she becomes a singer. And that's like her occupation that she's training for to eventually be when she's a full adult. Um, uh, but- and then there's, yeah, very little, like, and I think also the higher the numbers get, the more affluential you are as well i believe i don't i don't remember how the whole number system works all i know is that the boy she's in love with is is of a lower class i don't know if it's lower or higher numbers but he's lower class and she's not supposed to be with him she's supposed to be with other fives unless you are chosen for the selection to potentially marry the prince so this is like an opportunity to raise her class level um but because of her romance with this servant boy i think or something like that um she doesn't she oh i don't want to marry a prince i just i'll just you know i'll join his class and be a servant like it's like it, that's basically what's going on so basically you can see the direct the direct line uh because this is it might not scream post apocalyptic and it might not scream uh uh oh gosh what's the other word uh dystopia the dystopian uh but it is this does mm-hmm. take place in a, a futuristic america uh and a lot of like those old tiny uh society expectations rule a lot of this um especially of the the wealth the privilege of of competing and also you have children competing against children which is direct just like the hunger games that was part of the thing too of like being like oh how can we get all like that that like idea of coliseum sort of Mm. fighting for your people, your family, your district definitely had like that rise as well as the dystopian mm-hmm. and the survival part of all of this. And the other important part of selection is because it's basically the bachelor, right? That there, that's the plot. Um, you have all kinds of like beautiful parties and masquerade balls yes. and things. Okay. So vampire, the masquerade role players that just want to take their characters to a party all the time are very interested in this. So this, well, so you're probably like, hey, how do you guys know so much about the selection? Like, are you reading from the Wiki- Wikipedia page? No, actually, we're not. This took over Tumblr. There was selection RPs galore. Like, they were constant. They were starting up all the time. It was the strangest thing, and I was fascinated, okay? So I never joined one. And I'll tell you why, because this was the premise of all of them, is that you would make your character, you'd pick your number, you'd make your character like normal in the RP, and you'd join. And there was literal, like, work contests that you had to do either through, like, how often you posted or extra things that you did. And, like, there was literal, like, survival, survivor style elimination to, because that's how it works in the books. Like, you're, you're eliminated down and down and down until you get to marry the prince, right? So they literally, they were trying to do like Survivor in a role. It's so dumb. So obviously these role plays never lasted past the first couple of months because the second you start eliminating people, people's characters, and it's not fully their choice to get eliminated, guess what? Everyone's leaving your RP. Like it's so dumb. And because of that, they would only last a month or two, which so the people that were interested in, in these would like constantly make new ones. So like, I literally, like, I have this vivid memory of a post of somebody that was like in the selection RP community, because like, I followed all of them because I was fascinated with this whole craziness. Um, They were like, you know, I've been thinking about making just this a cute little fun new selection RP, just like a just like a short little quick little cute little RP. And like, that was basically the contents of their post. And I was like, yeah, because that's the only kind that exists. What? (laughs) It was crazy. It was cra- you basically you bring your character to a couple of masquerade balls and then like two or three characters get eliminated and then everyone bails on the RP. It would last two months tops. Um, yeah. Why? Why? Well, Tumblr was fascinated. Why? Well, why? I'll tell you why. Uh, because it involved 
things that white young women like <laughs> and that was masquerade yeah. balls uh a secret romance uh, a you know a, a being pulled in two directions between two men uh love triangle sort of thing fancy outfits and a young girl who does not feel like she is good at anything being good at everything oh and that is the formula that is if you want to write a best-selling novel figure out how to introduce all of those things as I should say a best-selling novel in the 2010s figure out how to combine all of those things and put it out there uh and that's and that's what that's what she did that's what they did they loved Uh, it like it was was insanely popular insanely uh and it was like one of those things where i was like this sounds so boring (laughs) i was just like it sounds so i think also like this is the other thing too is again doesn't live in a bubble so everything became romance, like everything devolved into romance. It stopped becoming about, especially at this level, stopped becoming about dystopian and overthrowing governments and more became about the the idea of competing and romance and all, and all of that. Uh, and the selection is the most extreme version of that, of being like, oh, The Hunger Games is basically The Bachelor. So, I mean, but that's just real life where you're having a, a romance and the government sucks at the same time. That's just, that's just America. Sure. Like, yeah, that's you're just, right. That's it's just, just America for 35 <laughs> women to be selected randomly. And all these women, by the way, beautiful. All of these course. women, gorgeous. All these women, skinny. <laughs> uh, uh-huh. Selected randomly and fought and fighting for a singular, singular man's hand. That's a hundred percent by the government. The government forces this. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's like a whole thing. So anyway, I never read the selection, but I observed the selection RP community for like a year, and I was I was enthralled. I was absolutely enthralled. So I feel like I read the selection, but I definitely didn't. I also just her name, America Singer. Yeah. I'm just like, Ew. yeah, yeah, <laughs> a little on the nose there, huh? Just a little touch on the nose. Oh. Okay, there we go. Sorry, my my. So we're yeah. we're about oh, halfway through. Landon, do we do we have a do we have a sponsor slide? Or we don't or have we a just... sponsor slide, but I oh, can let's... tell you about a book. Okay, let's Let do me it tell now. you about a book. Let's do it now. Okay, you guys. So oh. as y'all know, our podcast episodes of Interstage Window are sponsored by Audible. Um, Audible's great. That's how I read all my books. Um, if you are reading along with us through the Hunger Games. Um, yes, if you're reading along with us through the Hunger Games, you can definitely get Mockingjay, which we're going to be talking about next month, uh, on Audible. So audibletrial.com slash interstage window. Please, please go sign up if you're well, using that link, if you're interested in the service. Um, I, I use it and highly recommend it. Okay. What's our, what's our recommendation this week, Landon? Okay. You can't see it because it's fourth so wing. It's- No, I see it. Fourth oh, wing. Fourth wing. Uh, Karen, you need to read this book. Okay. I need, I need everybody to read this book. Here's the deal. This book. It's not going to win any awards. It's not the best written book I've read of this year. But dear God, is it just a book that has sucked me in. Uh, This wonderful book uh, takes place in a fantasy world where there are dragons. And uh, this takes place at a military college. Wow. Uh, where you can choose three different paths and our main character is forced to go down to the paths of being a dragon writer. Uh, basically what? 300 or some students choose to be dragon writers and by there is about a hundred of them living by the end of this book. Uh, <laughs> like that's not a spoiler. The whole, like the, the books, the, uh, the the college's name is basically Deathwing. Like it is a deadly competition to win the favor of dragons, and there's an enemies to lovers love story that doesn't take over the whole thing. There's immaculate governmental tension, uh, mommy issues if you have them. A sassy female main character. It is the perfect combination of a new adult fantasy romance that just is fantastic uh and i was like i'm not gonna like it and then i read the whole thing in six hours uh and i can't stop thinking about it landon but you just listed all of my favorite things i know (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, and it's on what? Audible. <laughs> what? Okay. All right. Um, I'll download it. We'll see Please. if I get around to reading it, but I, I will. Da- that sounds very good, actually. I it's, think I would enjoy that. I'm just like, holy shit, this is really good. It's a school romance with enemies, enemies to lovers and dragons. I'm my, I mean, my God, like, I mean, if you if I wasn't sold with like, oh, this is a school where where failing means dying. Like, yeah. if that didn't intrigue me already, the enemies to lovers like that's I'm sold. Yeah. And know? it's actually like true enemies to lovers, which oh, good. I love when that happens. Good. Oh, and then, of course, there is the the trope that I am now having like a thing for, which is like uh, uh, mind linking with somebody. Oh my god, of, I love like, that stuff. Being like, oh my god, you can read my mind because we have this weird connection. I'm just like, I hate this, but love it. It's so unhealthy and so toxic, but I love it so much. It's good, though. That's a good trope. That's a good trope it's right there. It's a good trope. So yeah, the yeah. Four, what did you say? Say the title one more time. Fourth it's, Wall? It's called Fourth... It's not even the Fourth Wing. It's just called Fourth Wing. Fourth Wing. Fourth the, Wing. Okay. The subtitle is Fly or Die. Fourth Wing. I'm typing it into the chat so people can see. Fourth Wing. Okay. Fourth um, Wing. Yeah, I'll download it. <laughs> Lunar's Thank like, you. I need you all to read this book. Yes, teacher. Yeah, that was definitely a yes, teacher moment. Okay, I'm yeah. intrigued. I, you've convinced me. I'll download You're it. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and like let's... I said, it's not, it's like, if you're looking for go- like politics, it's not, it's not it, but it is great for what it is. Mm, mm, mm-hmm. Well, there's, pol- I mean, if it's a military school, there's politics in there somewhere. Oh, there just yeah, might not be heavy yeah. politics, right? No, but it's not, it's like, this is obviously not a world. I, I, I don't, I think that the person, politics there's high ranking, there's order, there's enough thought and enough research built in that it is believable. Mm. I just don't know what the politics of the larger world are really going I see. Uh, and what is happening. But that might happen in the sequel. We might find out more. Okay, fantastic. Fourth so, wing. Got it. Fourth wing. Thank you for letting me talk about the book because I got I needed to. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> All right. Now we're going to talk about another series that I did not read. <laughs> so um tell us a little bit about this one because um because this is one of the ones that like I remember seeing the covers of these yes. around um but uh but th- that's all my memories of this so this one is also dystopian it takes place in a modern day at our world but in the future uh a young adult novel about a tightly controlled society so its government is super controlling in which young people are matched with their perfect life partners at the age of 17 because mm-hmm. we all know who we are going to be for the rest of our lives at age 17 i i know uh, i did <laughs> so uh cassie rise is matched with her best friend xander uh and it is not a good match from what i gather it is not like she is she i think there's someone else that she likes but it is the the basis of this is being like oh this world is no good Mm -hmm. so it sounds Uh, like a a soulmates situation where they don't like each other at first well they're they're friends but they're just friends oh Uh, but it's also like the government is trying to control who you're with so that there isn't a huge amount of emotion i believe thrown in mm. there so that like no one is feeling passionate so that people are with okay people right but it is this idea of like oh you have to be with your person mm-hmm. or you're arrested mm. like super controlling government mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. so it is like breaking out of this governmental control sort of thing so this one um this one i never i never like uh grabbed on to this one so my memories of it are just that it existed. Um, and yes. I don't think it ha- it did not have a big fandom presence. I do not recall it being present in the dystopian fandom very much. No, I think I think that it was the people who read the uglies also seemed to read the selection and match. Yes, like, I it was would like, agree that. was that. like a trio of of like being like, oh, you were into you weren't into the revolution grit yeah. of Hunger Games. You were into the social dynamics and romance of Hunger Games. Yep, I would agree uh, with that. And the selection was just the popular one, so it's the one I saw everywhere. Yes, and and ugly. I think that Uglies and Match had their own people, but I think that the selection is the one that like was the longest standing and had the biggest fandom. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so matched so, one one that so matched. one that didn't it didn't get any adaptations either. It did not. No. Yeah. Um. Not at all. All right, we'll talk about one of my absolute favorites. I had to add okay. this to the list. This is one we actually know a lot more about. 
Yes, a lot more about it. about I love this series. But, and I honestly think Karen would love the series too if she'd read it. Uh, <laughs> but I think I, think I would think, as well. And I know enough about it from Osmosis through you and the fandom. This one does have a really big fandom. Yes. So I, it, it feels, I was like, it was the right time frame. It has the same themes. I think that it is loosely based off of, whether it was based off of Hunger Games, I don't know, but I think it was definitely inspired by the zeitgeist that Hunger Games created. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this is the Lunar Chronicles, which is a futuristic dystopian world based sci-fi novel, fantasy novel, uh, based off of uh, of four retellings of fairy tales that also have... uh, aliens sort of like sailor moon moon power aliens sort of attached to it so how i like to consider it is it is uh you know fairy tale meets sailor moon meets hunger games sort of aspects of things and you know Uh, i feel like the timing of this one also be it kind of like took a turn towards like the sci-fi fantasy realm you know away from the apocalyptic realm and i feel like the timing of it because when i started hearing about it was when um game of thrones tv show was coming out and that was getting popular so i feel like it would this was kind of like this was like a little pivot you know this was like a little pivot from that zeitgeist to the new zeitgeist i think it i think it straddled the straddled the two genres Mm -hmm. the genre shift really well and i think that that's why it's got popular because it existed in both sets that it was and it was far enough removed from hunger games that it did not feel like you were reading the same thing Mm -hmm. uh like if you were craving that hunger games feeling then this wouldn't necessarily settle that but obviously it came before the hype of uh, of game of thrones really turning the world and and fantasy taking over uh because it exists in a in a uh dystopian sort of setting so Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, but it, it basically, it's a fantastic series of, uh, basically you follow the story of Cinder, who plays, who's Cinderella, who is also, uh, a cyborg and, uh, her, her journey through this world with anti-cyborg beliefs, as well as like falling in love with the prince who has, who has to have like a political marriage with the princess of the moon, uh, who is evil and an alien race that like can take over Earth. and it's it's an interesting like the politics are interesting uh, and cinder obviously instead of like inward turning towards the politics of earth has to overcome the politics of the invading army which is di- which is different but it is still that like overthrowing revolution aspect of like a lot of people are anti-cyborg and anti-lunar and cinder has to fight those sort of like standards and and they have to like fight those beliefs This, out of everything that we have talked about here, because this is kind of like the Pivot series and it has a massive fandom, this is actually one of the series that I could see us taking on on the podcast at some point. It totally fits. It totally fits. (laughs) Anti-Lunar, anti-me. Who's anti-Lunar? Nobody's anti-Lunar. Nobody's (laughs) anti-Lunar. Not me. No, but Lunars are the name of the alien race. Listen. I would, <laughs> part of me is like, I need you to read Akatar, but I actually need you to read this series more. Uh, well, I think this I, this fits um, the types of things we cover on yes, our podcast very, very I well. Agree. So like, it's on the secret list I have in my head of like, what we might should cover. Tell me, tell me when. Yes. <laughs> 20, Lunar Chronicles coming 2024. We don't even have to read the last two. It's only four books. Oh, the footnet, the last two are not out yet? They're not, they're novellas. They're oh, they're novellas. Pre- there's like a prequel, but it's like 120 pages or something. Okay, like that. so really, Cinder, Scarlet Crest, and Winter is the series, mm-hmm. and the other books are like additional. Understood. I did not know that. I this is one of the ones that I only know through my absorption through fandom because it has such a massive fandom, kind of like yes. selection. And mm-hmm. I also exist in your life, and I just That's talk true. about this book series a lot. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's been on our. You recommended Cinder a couple of times on the. Our I have. Audible. It's mm-hmm. a fantastic book series. Uh, and I've heard great things about the audiobook too. I'm sure it's good. I'm sure it's good. It's popular enough. It's got to be good. So, yeah. uh, all right. Let's talk about the last one. Shatter Me. Okay. I remember being so enamored with these <laughs> book covers, seeing them in the bookstore. They were the most gorgeous thing. I cannot tell you how many times I picked this up and flipped it over and read the back and put it back down. I have like, I know what it's about because I have this thing. I did the same exact thing. It was like every single time I was like, oh my God, that's so beautiful. And I went to go pick it up and read it. And then was like, 
not funny. Yes. Uh, also, didn't know that there was fucking 10 of them. Right. I, I didn't was like, either. I was like, maybe two, maybe two. I Turns assumed it was a trilogy, 10. honestly. Uh, so Shatter Me is a dystopian fiction that tells the story of a teenage girl who has never been able to experience human touch. Uh, labeled as a freak, she finds herself locked up in an asylum where she is left in complete isolation until the reestablishment decides that they want her to use her as a weapon. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think there's some sort of magic power, mm-hmm. something to do with. Yeah, there's power. It, it, it again also straddles that line of like, that's the interesting thing too of, of fantasy, uh, the, the dystopian meets fantasy, which is an interesting intersection that happens a lot in YA and doesn't happen in any other genre in any other like age great gap not really uh yeah. but it is it is like that thing of like oh she has powers and that's why she can't touch people but then all of a sudden this like uh this this rebel group wants to use her as a weapon mm-hmm. and so uh and obviously she meets boy in the weapon and does the whole thing and song and dance and blah blah blah, blah. but it's just like one of those things where it was like I don't need this in my life again. <laughs> so here's the thing with this book, um, with this book series, because I didn't realize it was 10 either until like literally today. I thought it was mm-hmm. like a trilogy or something. Um, because although you wouldn't see like Shatter Me RPs, but you would see RPs with this same plot, um, but like different characters. Like the, basically what the role play community was doing, they love the tropes of like, oh, someone getting turned into a weapon or someone not being able to touch someone because of their powers or whatever. But they weren't based, they weren't calling them like shatter me RPs, right? Like they were making an RP and it would be like this same plot with totally different cast and face claims and things like that. Um, So this clearly had an impact, but I think everyone must have done what we had done where they picked it up and put it right back down. Um, but those tropes did seep but in all over the place in fandom. But obviously not enough if there's 10 books. Like a publisher was making enough money off of this book series to go 10 books deep. Like right? there there it might not be a series, but there it like 10 10 books. That is so much <laughs> I'm just trying to think of like the 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 publishing industry version of that. That's ten. If you come out with a book a year, ish, a book every nine months, that's that's nine to eight years. Yes. For this, which is the span in which someone enters young adult age and leaves the young adult genre. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh so like, but it's like a lot to ask fans that have come in halfway through to stick with a series and then it's also like no one is finishing the series when you're like when you're like oh that's a series I read in my teenage years and it was all right I'm not gonna read the last three books now as an adult but like yeah I just I'm just like how who it must have been more than a book a year it must have been there must have been like a book every six months or something or maybe there's like a group of young zoomers out there that like really love Shatter Me. There's like 12 of them and that it was like very formative for them or something like that, right? I've seen similar trope of powers triggered by touch, no, but I've never heard of the series itself, right? Like, are, exactly, Arya, like the, this trope is everywhere, especially around this time in the fanfic and roleplay community. This trope was everywhere, but the Shatter Me series itself was not popular. So clearly everyone was aware, but nobody was really reading this, at least not to my knowledge. Yeah. It's a book a year. It is a book a year. Okay. It is a book a year. Uh, first one was in two thousand uh, in two thousand twenty one, which means the most recent one was twenty twenty one. Uh, sorry, two thousand eleven. I know yeah. my math and say That's okay. and say words. Two thousand. Um, I was trying to figure out like what she, what did she mean to say? Two thousand eleven. Um, twenty eleven to twenty twenty one. Okay. Twenty twenty one. So uh, some, so some young so some young zoomers in like ten years are going to be making shatter me video essays. Get ready. Ew. <laughs> uh, but I mean, and also, but like in that same vein, where is the connection to to uh, Hunger Games? A dystopian world. B special girl is the person who can change the revolution story, uh, and and like that use of as a weapon. And that's what I mean. Uh, Katniss had a lot more agency in her use as the rebellion, and she had a lot more thing like want than necessarily this main character did, just because of the buildup for 
two books worth of this. But this person, uh, like that, that concept of that trope, as you were saying, of being like, oh, your use is the government's weapon. Like that's basically what Hunger Games does to Katniss in the last in the last book. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep, for sure, for sure. So, woo! Me, that was that one. Shut me. <clears throat> that was it. That's it. That's all I got. Okay, so I want to just like as a little wrap up. Um, do you have an additional slide, or is this the last slide? This is the last okay. slide. I can go all to right, the beginning so- though if you want. So we're going to switch back to just just looking at our beautiful faces. Okay, so a couple of things that you guys probably noticed about this trend, very important. You got to have some kind of controlling government or in the case of Maze Runner, a corporation. Two, you got to have a special girl. Every once in a while, it's okay to have a special boy, but you got to have a special girl like three-fourths of the time. That's mostly and that's special, what it is. That yeah. special boy has a special girl. Like right. that's the other special thing too. Boy, special boy always has a special girl that's smarter than him. Um, <laughs> uh, also... Uh, What you have to understand about these books is at the end of the day, what most of them are are about is about coming of age, which is not true for Hunger Games. I rereading Hunger Games as an adult, like, yes, Katniss does come of age in that, but that's not what they were about. They are literally about the oppression of the government. But most of these books, they're really, they're not really about the oppression of the, of the government. They're more like what I would call like Sailor Moon type of stories. Like, yes, Sailor Moon does fight like things that are trying to oppress various groups, but that's not what it's about. It's really about her coming of age. And most of these, what's what that's what they're really about. So what's so crazy to me about this is that like, you know, Hunger Games is what's popular, but the certain elements that are actually part of what turned into this zeitgeist and then the elements of Hunger Games that are not part of this zeitgeist, I find incredibly fascinating. I think that that's the other thing like that coming of age concept exists because it is a young adult novel like Mm -hmm. coming of age and like is basically a requirement for to fit into the young adult category period end of story uh I think unpopular opinion here if Hunger Games had been written 10 years later I think uh, Susan Collins would have aged them up and made it a new adult book because I think that it is not that coming of age. Like that was never her purpose. Yeah. Uh, and maybe she wouldn't have aged them up, but she would have at least upped the upped the concepts and uh, upped the little bit of, of things that made it more kid friendly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think that she would have thrived in new adult, which is what I think has happened in this new book is from everything I've heard. It's a little bit better to read it. Uh, And I think because that that concept of it not being about coming of age, everything else is going to be about coming of age because it fits inside the young adult category. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hunger Games, wall is young adults. I don't know if it's young adult. It's just not, its audience is not adults and therefore is young adult. Something has really changed between now and then. And I believe that purity culture has gotten its hooks in so much more now than when we were younger, because I don't remember anyone ever even suggesting that Hunger Games was not appropriate for teenagers to be reading. Oh, no one suggested that. I agree with you on some level, but I think that if Hunger Games was queer and if it was about race politics, outwardly about race politics, there would have been. I don't know, because here's the thing. It was about race politics and we just all pretended it wasn't. mm -mm, But parents, the wonderful thing about working in a school, parents don't read what their kids are reading. So when you look and you watch the Hunger Games, it's not about for the for the average viewer. Not we're not on our not us crazy leftists. The average viewer is not going to consume and go, hey, that was about race. But here's the thing. The reason why, like, I think if you made Hunger Games today, the the way that it is now, is people would say that. But that's because we've got so many of these stupid talking heads on Twitter and YouTube and stuff that will point it out to the parents and make them think about it. I don't I don't think so, because I I, everything that's being banned and everything that's being questioned isn't about dystopian universes. It's about contemporary literature. Mm, It's about literature that is a direct reflection of our world today. Uh, Media literacy the, is the dead. Criticism, 
the criticism of uh, today's society. That is what is being banned and blocked and and and, and gate, gated. Uh, so I think this would have slipped through the cracks. I think that uh, we'll see. I'm teaching. I'm t- did I tell you this? I'm teaching Hunger Games next year. As my six, as my six, uh, you did, but I don't know. I don't know if you, I don't know Uh, if you told the stream, but yeah, I'm so so curious how that will go. I'm doing a whole, I convinced my, I convinced my, uh, curriculum supervisor to allow me to do, uh, Hunger Games as our re, as our like big book to read together as class. Uh, because I think that it's like, sure, there is some, there was some stigma and some parents might have questions on violence but no one is going to look at hunger games and go oh she's indoctrinating children yeah are you saying like my parents were hesitant about the whole kids killing each other part and i'm sure that that was that was the case but but there's always been parents like like that Um, well and you also you also have books like ringer which is like a classic book about a kid who kills like whose job it is to kill like animals and uh like they're kids killing kids is actually a theme in litter in young adult literature especially in the classics for mm-hmm. their whole lot for like for years mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> so people don't even think about it in the same way like at I think all that, i think it is that culling of kids which is different yeah. and totally understand that cer- certain certain audiences but i i don't think parents would blink twice at it because well, I'll be yeah. really curious. You'll have to update us in the fall whenever you actually like launch this particular um, piece of curriculum at uh, what the parent reaction was. I will be very curious. And I think our viewers will be very curious as well. I, I have a feeling parents won't give a shit. Because I don't that's think the they will either. Too. Like that's. But I, was, I don't think not they to know. Make this, not to make this stream hyper political, but parents, the amount of parents that read what the kids read is zero there's not a single parent that read ender's game with us this year i believe it which by the way could say that i'm indoctrinating more than i think hunger like i think that that's a red or flag ender's yeah game and in the other flag, direction very, but <laughs> it, well well and certain and also but it depends on how you teach it as far as True. it being like it you can be like it's really it's really anti or like being like is this a good thing to allow children to be taken from their home and mm. abused by the government mm. like <laughs> <laughs> um yep. yeah it's just an interesting I, I i think it'll be interesting to see but i think that media literacy is dead absolutely yeah. i i don't think people are looking at i i think especially because ya has a reputation to not be serious to to be the shatter me series to be the like it's the same i feel like ya has the same reputation as romance novels do as far as it being like, oh, it's it's whatever, uh, which is so not fucking true. It's not. Because so much YA is political. So much YA is written for the modern day teenager, which are which is one of our most political demographics in the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, I I think that that is the naivety that people don't understand. But it. it <laughs> But people don't, but parents don't read what their kids are reading yeah. because they assume that it doesn't matter unless there is a direct red flag of a queer character or this is about race. So sad. Directly. So sad. And if you read the description of Hunger Games, even though it is a clear indication of race and poverty, there is nothing about it that that sends up that red flag, which kind of is cool because it, it, it makes it covert. Mm hmm. Well, I do remember, I mean, there was a very real thing in the Hunger Games fandom when the movies came out and people were like, oh, my God, Rue's black. I didn't imagine it. it's literally in the book. It says she's black. But OK, well, I guess you can't read that happened. No. Well, because people people and they skim. They're not project, really reading. They're not really well, they understanding. Don't read, but they also project themselves mm-hmm. into books. And so if you mm-hmm. are a white person who's surrounded by just white people, the concept of black people being in books is going to be foreign. And you're not yep. going to be looking for it. And you're not going to accept it when it happens or when it says it because you're like, I'm going to want my perspective of it. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. So yeah, so that's our little kind of deviation from the Hunger Games itself into why a dystopia and post-apocalyptic series. 
Um, we hope you enjoyed it. We hope you got some good wrecks out of it because if you're kind of like us and reading along, then you're finishing up the Hunger Games and you might be feeling like you need to read some more like young adult dystopian-esque uh, fiction. So hopefully there was one in here that spoke to you or just uh, that read you would be wing. interested in. Or just read Fourth Wing. Uh yeah, just read Fourth Wing. I think that's what we're all going to do. We're all just going to go read Fourth Wing. Although I am very intrigued by Shatter Me because of the sheer amount of books that are that's in the so series. No, no, you can't I'm intrigued. Shatter. You can't do that to me. You can't. I'm intrigued. Like, I have given you four different series that are worth reading before Shatter Me. There's a reason <laughs> that there's 10 books and I need to know why. You know what? This no. I, how it makes me feel seeing that there's 10 books the same way that I would see like 20 different the selection RPs <laughs> pop up. Fascinating. Why are there so many? My gosh. Because it's about a young girl stuck in a being useful to the world, stuck between two boys. And that's what that's the shit that we love. Oh my god. All right. So let's wrap this up. Landon, where can everybody find you, my friend? Oh, you can find me on Instagram or on TikTok. Hey, there's some fun stuff coming up on TikTok. Your girl's gonna try to be more marketable and try to be more on there. So you can follow me at Land in Maine on All any right. of those accounts. Uh, and then you can also find me here most Saturdays. Mm-hmm. I feel like now that I am able to breathe, I'll actually be here. Yes, Landon is free for the summer, you guys. Free for the summer. So we should be seeing her a little bit more regularly. Um, We don't have a crazy uh, school schedule to work around. Yeah. All right, you guys. Here's all the places you can find me. You know how it works. The only thing I really want you to know, though, instead of my normal, is that my birthday is in one month. Okay? And it is actually on a Saturday. So we are going to stream. And during the stream, I am actually going to open up birthday gift. So that one is one back there from Lunar. So if you would like to get me a birthday gift to open on stream, then you want to click on the um, the throne wish list. So that's on here. Yeah. So you'll want to click on the throne wish list and get something from there. You can also do recommendations on there if you hate all the things that are already on the list. And yes, after my stream, we're going to raid into Lunar and we're going to watch some um, FNAF. So, so that's what we're going to... So on Saturday, be here for that um, on july 22nd and yeah you can get a throne gift Mm -hmm. if you want to be included in that in that opening so that's all the things so if you are watching on youtube don't forget to like comment subscribe down below and of course as always don't forget to make it a great day and don't forget to be awesome bye bye guys